grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The portion of Holy Scripture that we focus on this day, a special day, not just the fifth Sunday of Easter, but a day in which hopefully, well, you're going to extend a call, but hopefully to the next pastor who will serve you, is the gospel lesson for this day. John chapter 15, verses 1 and following. I'm not going to read them all again. They're very familiar verses. Just a couple of verses to refresh your memory, what goes on here. Jesus begins his parable by saying, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. In verse 5, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So far, God's word. In the name of our Lord and Savior, dear fellow redeemed, by the blood of the Lamb, by the resurrection of our Lord, we have life. In his precious name, amen. I think this is the first time I've been here for, yeah, to preach. I ser- I'm Pastor John Willie. I serve as the district president for South Wisconsin District, and uh, you're a member of that district. It stretches from Lake Michigan all the way over to the Mississippi and from about Highway 10 in the middle part of the state to that border with the Chicago Bear people to the south. Uh, I say that because of the draft yesterday. You know, I used to live in Illinois, so I was a sole Packer fan in southern Illinois for a while. I took torment for seven years because the Packers weren't very good then. So uh, it's good to be with you on this day. You're an important part of our district because you're one of the 213 congregations of the South Wisconsin District. One of the 55-ish congregations that has an elementary school. Uh, So you're an important part of what goes on here, an important witness in this community to the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, an important part of your lives as well as the people of God in this place. That's why I chose to preach on the gospel lesson for this morning. Verses that are probably well familiar to each and every one of you. Verses, especially the second one that I read, I am the vine, you are the branches, may have been your confirmation verse at some point a long time ago or now or more recently. In these verses, Jesus is telling a parable. As we know, a parable is a heavenly an earthly story that everybody understands with a heavenly or spiritual meaning. The basic elements of this parable are very easy to understand. A vineyard owner... There are grapes, there is a vine dresser, and then there are probably workers in that vineyard as well. If you've ever driven past a vineyard, maybe in the west central part of the state, there's a bunch of them out there. You've seen the beauty of a vineyard. Row after row, perfect rows of grapes hanging on, 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 on stanchions to keep the grapes off the ground. Beautiful plants, good things go on in vineyards. But vineyards are not planted so much for pleasant trees to the eye, but for producing grapes. Grapes that can be used in a variety of things, making wine especially. Jesus tells this parable, and it's a parable about connections. You know, if Jesus were to tell this parable today, he would probably, maybe, instead of wines and vines, he might possibly use the end of a cord, an electrical cord. We all know about those. We plug them in all the time. We plug them into the wall so a refrigerator can run. We plug them into the wall so a computer can recharge its batteries. A table lamp might take up nice space and be decorative on a coffee table. But come 9 o'clock at night, it would be no good unless you're able to flip the switch and light comes from there. A refrigerator might provide nice shelves for food. But that food would spoil very quickly if the refrigerator wasn't plugged into the wall, connected so that electricity could fuel the generator that cools the food down. Even a wireless computer needs to be connected to wireless system so that we can access the internet. Otherwise, it's just a word processing machine. Connections are an important part of life. Being connected with a family is vital. Father and mother, sons and daughters, grandparents, extended family. If your family is scattered across the country, You know that one of the great conveniences these days, you open a computer, you can dial it up, and you can see people thousands of miles away. It's one of the joys of my life every Saturday when I'm home. I get to see my grandkids in California or in Minnesota or a daughter who lives in Washington, D.C. What we only dreamed about in my generation and Walt Disney had in his future world or whatever he called the Tomorrowland 
has become a reality. We can see and talk to people in real time far, far away. We can see children and grandchildren. It's a blessing to be connected with family in that way. And I think you probably know where I'm going next. Every Sunday, it's a blessing to be connected with our Lord as he comes to us in divine service through word and sacrament. Connecting with our Lord as an essential aspect of being and remaining a believer. Just as the refrigerator unplugged, the food inside spoils. So unconnected, unplugged from Jesus that as he comes to us with his blessings through word and sacrament and divine service, our faith simply withers away and dies. That's what these verses of John chapter 15 are all about. And they fit with what you're going to do, whoops, they fit with what you're going to do this morning, calling a new pastor here. For you, the pastor is an essential aspect of being connected to Jesus by word and sacrament ministry. Connected to Jesus by word and sacrament, faith thrives. Connected with Jesus by word and sacrament, your lives become fruitful examples of what it means to be a child of God in this place and beyond this place where you live and work and where you shine like stars in the universe. A person doesn't have to be an experienced gardener to appreciate what Jesus says in John chapter 15. This time of the year, brush piles begin to appear on the curb or alongside the street. Unwanted low-hanging limbs are cut off, cut off from the tree because the limbs serve no purpose. It has no life, perhaps. We need to shape them up and prune them back. But grafted into a tree, a limb produces leaves. If it's an apple tree, it produces apples. If it's a grapevine, it produces grapes. And what, that's what people look for when the fall comes. Apples on an apple tree and grapes on a grapevine. To live, a, to, to live, a branch needs to be connected to a vine or a tree. Without life-giving nourishment that the vine or the tree provides, the branch dies. That's the image that Jesus has in mind when he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Without the vine, the branches die. It's just a simple fact of life. Without a relationship with our Lord Jesus, we're dead inside, dead spiritually. Without God and without hope in the world, as the Apostle Paul said. And that's undoubtedly why no less than seven times in this short parable, Jesus repeats something again and again. I don't know if you caught it in the verses that were read. He says, if a man remain in me, and I in him. It's remain in me, the three words. If repetition is the mother of learning, and it is, then this parable is a lesson in learning the importance of remaining in Christ Jesus as Lord and Savior. That's an important lesson to keep in mind because it's easy these days for us to distance ourselves from our Lord Jesus. In the fit of, a, in the fit of prideful rage, we can walk out the door and never come back. It can happen if we turn our lives over to our sinful desires. The sinful desires of our human heart, you know, Jesus' words in Matthew, out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. All of those are wedges that pull us away from God if we allow them to have root and to spring up in our lives. It can happen also when we allow other concerns, other priorities, to slowly put a wedge between us and him in our relationship. So slowly pushing us, pushing him out of our lives. The bottom line is, from this parable, no connection with Jesus means no relationship with him. No relationship with him means no forgiveness and no life, either eternally or here. Jesus says, remain in me. The being a Christian is about a relationship with our Lord Jesus. That's a relationship that began probably for most all of us on the day that we were baptized. For me, it was some 65 years ago. I don't remember I was just a little baby. They hauled me into church. I probably cried and threw a fit like many babies do on the day they're baptized. Simple water was poured over my head in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, just like it was for you. And on that day, something changed. God the Father adopted you into his family of believers. Through that simple water connected with his word, he created saving faith in your heart. If you were baptized as a little baby, think back. Has there ever been a day, 
a time in your life when you didn't know Jesus as Lord and Savior? Didn't you go to him for forgiveness even as a child? It roots itself way back in the sacrament of holy baptism. Simple water connected with his word. St. Paul tells us how powerful that is. He writes in the letter of the Corinthians, or don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom? But he says, and and then he has all sorts of a list of sins. And he says, some of you were such, but you were washed, you were justified, you were sanctified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God. St. Peter takes pen in hand and he writes, baptism now saves you, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So that fits with the Easter message. All of which means to say that baptism is not just something that happened a long time ago. It may not be something that you can remember, but it's something that's one of the most single, most important events in our lives as the people of God. Consider the words that St. Paul writes in Romans chapter 6. Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. So baptism means a new life. Baptism means life. It means green leaves. It means grapes. It means new life of faith for those who believe. Jesus connected himself to us when he took human flesh and blood, was wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a manger. Jesus connected himself to you when every day of his life he obeyed every one of God's Ten Commandments perfectly, never once sinning, so that you could have that perfection as you stand before the judgment throne. Jesus connected himself to you when he took took your sins upon himself on the cross to pay for them. Father, forgive them, he says. Jesus connected himself to us when he entered the grave and then also when he rose to give us the promise of eternal life. All wrapped up in the sacrament of holy baptism, God's precious gifts to you. He comes to you through word and sacrament, through body and blood and bread and wine in the Lord's Supper to give all of those precious gifts to you. And today you set about as a congregation to call a full-time pastor to manage those special gifts here in your midst. You're not hiring a man to take care of the office or the, or, the, or the grounds. The 11 things that are on the call document that you're going to ask the new man to do, the new pastor, all focus in the proclamation, the administration of word and sacrament to make sure that people, you, are connected to the vine. The early church, when extended a call to replace Judas, this was their prayer, and it was my encouragement for your call committee when I met with them a long while back. Lord, show us the one which you have chosen to take the place in this ministry. You get a vote today on who you want the next pastor to be. Choose well. Choose prayerfully. Because the Lord is choosing through you. Lord, show us the one you have chosen to make the connection between us, between you and your Savior. Because every Sunday as you gather together, as you move into the future, after he is installed, he will be here in this pulpit. He will stand before that altar to proclaim God's word, to administer the sacraments, and to announce forgiveness, always in the stead and by the command of my, my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as the words of the liturgy say. A pastor is a connection between you and God calling on the sick and the shut-in, visiting the homes, teaching the young, being part of school life, being part of confirmation, leading the church in the way that God wants this congregation to go, connected with God through word and sacrament ministry. That's where it all begins, and that's what the pastor is supposed to do. You're calling him to do just that. Connected in that way, your faith will thrive. Connected in that way, as the pastor proclaims word and sacrament and you walk together with him, your lives will be fruitful in this congregation and in this community of East Troy where God has placed you. You know, this time of year, everybody does some kind of planting. Yesterday afternoon, my wife said, let's go buy some trees. 
So we walked, we trekked off to Steins and bought two arborvitas to put in pots so that we can have them by the front door so we have some greenery. That's just the beginning, because there will be more, I know that, because the flowers are all wrong. <laughs> we do this journey every year. We've done it for almost 40 years now, so I know what's coming, as most husbands probably do. And that's wonderful because by the time she gets done, the yard looks great. Petunias and flowers and green things here and there and in the backyard as well. Flowers and fruits and vegetables are, are evidence that plants are alive. If you plant a garden, you go to a tomato plant to find nice, ripe, juicy red fruit at some time, maybe in July or August. If a petunia is hit by a drought, you don't see the flowers because they can't produce flowers. And what's true for what we plant is also true in the spiritual world. Jesus looks for fruit. He looks for production. He looks for evidence of faith. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. He also says, this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. <clears throat> faith is an interesting thing. It's not just locked up in our hearts. It's not just tucked away in one room in which we lock the door and open it on Sunday morning for an hour or two. Faith is to permeate and affect everything that we are and everything that we do. Being a believer is a full-time calling. It is a way of life. That's what he's talking about when he talks about fruits and faith working together. It's a vocation that we have as the people of God. It's a vocation to be the people of God. The Apostle Paul talks about those fruits when he writes to the Galatians and he says the only thing that matters is faith expressing itself through love. St. James writes, Faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. Jesus says the same thing here in these verses. Wherever there is a faith connection with him, that faith connection be, can be seen, can be heard in what it produces in an individual's life. It's the nature of faith to change things. It's the nature of faith to produce. It's the nature of, just like it's the nature of a tomato plant to bear tomatoes. By God's design, your faith is to produce as well. However, the fruits that our faith produces are more than valuable than tomatoes, more precious than apples more beautiful than the flowers of a rose or a petunia. Toward the end of his letter to the Galatians, St. Paul writes, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Fits with these verses because Jesus is talking about grapes and vines bearing fruit. Again, the verse is, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Each of those is evidence of a person's faith that lives in the heart. It acts out. It, you can hear it. You can see it in their lives. And those fruits are important. Important for you in this congregation as you interact with each other. Important for the people with whom you come in contact wherever you might be. You see, those fruits are evidence of God at work alive in your life. Those fruits are evidence to all who are willing to listen and hear and see that the Lord has worked to change in your life. No longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints, members of the household of God. It's fruit that only God himself can produce in a life that's connected with him. Fruit for you to rejoice in but fruit for others to see as well. It's about your witness to those around in this community. Martin Luther writes this. It's about, he's writing, it's a sermon on Matthew, chapter 5, but it fits here as well. Martin Luther says, God gives his grace to no one, so that it might lie down and be of no benefit, but so that it would give a good return, and through knowledge and outward public demonstration entice everyone to God. Christ says, let your light so shine before people that they may see your good works and praise your Father in heaven. Did you catch the fruit reference that it would give good return? You are God's people in this congregation. 
You are God's people in this community. You are family members and neighbors. You are workers and friends. You are strangers to people on the street or in the store. You are God's people here at Good Shepherd. God himself has placed you here at this time and in this place for his purpose, to bear fruit. He's called you here, established you here, so that the cross of his son might not just be something on a steeple, but so that it might be seen, lived out in your life. That's what these words of John chapter 15 are about. You are connected to our Lord by his word and sacrament. Connected through word and sacrament, your faith shines. Connected, by your, connected to our Lord Jesus, your lives are fruitful, producing a powerful witness of what it means to be a child of God, a most precious gift that anyone can have. That's why Jesus says it seven times, remain in me, remain in me, remain in me. Remain in me. Again and again he says it. And part of that relationship is that pastor that you will call. Will it be the first pastor? I don't know. It might be the second or the third. Only God determines that. You, he works through you, through your vote. To extend the call, my prayer is that you do it prayerfully. Lord, show us the one you have chosen not, to, not motivated by self-will, but following God's guidance. Choosing the man best who will serve you. Best who will lead you in God's ways. So that you can remain in him. Connected to Jesus. By both word and sacrament. My, my encouragement to all congregations is to choose. And to choose prayerfully. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. And then the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Guard, keep, and protect your hearts and minds through faith in our Lord Jesus. Amen.